apologize. Can you hear me? We are whole. This is excellent. Great news. Um, all right, everyone. So welcome to this. We are at Exploring Co-op Structures. We are going to get a real treat today because we get to hear from Tim Hewitt of Arizmendi, and we get to hear of Joseph Curitan of Obron. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're thinking here at Co-op Cincy, but these two have really interesting structures that they have put together um, to support um, how can we come together better? How can we come together more effectively, uh, create more impact together? Erez Mendy went about it in a really interesting and exciting way. Um, Tim will be presenting first because this has been underway for much longer than Obron or Co-op Cincy. Um, we'll hear all about that. Then we'll hear Joseph for 10 minutes talk to us about Obron's really interesting um, cooperative conglomerate. Then you'll hear from me for about 10 minutes ar around where Co-op Cincy is in this process, how we're thinking about it. We'll be trying each of us to be thinking about the pros and cons of the ways we're currently approaching it. And excitingly, um, in our group, we actually have some people, uh, we have some lawyers here, including Eric Gritton, who is a really seasoned co-op lawyer, uh, who even helped to write, rewrite the co-op law in Ohio, who will be also listening and offering some questions to us to help us think all this through. Because our hope is that through this session, we can be really thoughtful together about what, how might we mix and match things? What, you know, what might make sense for different areas? How, what can we all be doing to help all of this cooperative movement take off like wildfire everywhere? So to start, we're going to hear from Tim. And Tim, I think, has some slides for us. Is that correct, Tim? Yeah, well, let's see. Uh, are they coming up now? Not that I see, but where they where it would come from would be that little sort of it looks like a TV or a computer monitor kind of thing. Is that what you're hitting? That is what I'm hitting, but I'll try it again. Okay. If not, you sent them to me and I, I will work on it. Why don't we go ahead and do it that way? Okay. Um, since I've tried right. twice. Okay, let's see here. So where it is, though, is it went into my, let's see, I just opened them and it went right into a presentation for me like this presentation. So maybe I should show, I'm working with my tech person here, Clancy, who is wonderful. Okay. And I'm going to show you what it shows me. It wants me to just pick a tab. That's great. There it is. Cool. Great. Okay. So Thank I'm you. with the Arizmendi Association. Oh, go ahead. No, sorry. You just tell me when to move them forward. Thanks. Great. So I'm with the Arizmendi Association of Cooperatives. We grew out of a study trying to figure out why there are a lot more worker cooperatives in other parts of the world, uh, thriving movements, and what the U.S. needed to learn to catch up. Um, so our name comes from, it, I just see a circle. Is Are the slides showing for other people? I see them clearly. Do other people see them? Joseph, can you see them? Hmm. Um, strange. Uh, well, let's, let's go to the next slide and see if that updates this little picture I, I see. It's now showing Spain. In Portugal, do you not see that, Tim? Hmm. No. Huh. Uh, Internet glitches are no fun. No. So uh, the first slide I had was a picture of Father Jose Maria Maria Arzmente. Is that not the second? That's what slide? I was showing until I thought you wanted me to go to the next one. I see. Okay. Well. Hmm. Very strange. Um, well, I'm going to try to, to see if I can do this from memory of where we probably are. <laughs> so uh, in any case, we studied the Italian cooperative model and um, the Basque cooperative model. The Basques are um, in the northern part of Spain and southern part of France. Um, 
and they have a very complex history uh, going back centuries, but their cooperative is going back to 1956. If we want to head a slide forward. Sometimes um, I give presentations about that history and, and, and that can take quite a while, but I'm just going to go ahead and give the five minute version. Um, at this point, they have um, 800,000 jobs in their cooperatives and they're the seventh biggest company in Spain when you count all the cooperatives. Um, just to give you an example, they're the biggest retail chain in Spain. So when you go to something that looks like a Walmart, it's a grocery store, department store, etc. Um, that's actually owned by its workers. That's the biggest um, retail chain in, in all of Spain. And one of the things that was particularly interesting to me is that they have uh, their own bank. Um, and all the cooperatives put their money in the bank and that's lent out to create new cooperative enterprises. One of the particularly interesting features of that is they don't just wait for people to come to them with ideas. They have their own entrepreneurial division that develops their own business plans. And if someone comes from a new city and they say, we want to create jobs in our, our region, um, they already have a business plan waiting for them and they can give them support. Or if they already have a business idea, but it's not fully developed, the people on that staff can actually help them develop uh, it into a full business plan. So um, cutting, cutting the history a bit short, going to the next slide, it's uh, what, what we tried to learn from Mondragon. One is that they grew from success. What we found in the United States was people were starting businesses, um, then they started another business was completely unrelated and they weren't really growing um, as part of a network. Um, whereas the Mondragon cooperatives, if they were making a, a, an oven and they were using glass in the door, um, they would say, hey, let's learn how to make glass ourselves and then we'll, we'll buy from that new cooperative, but they'll also sell to the outside. Um, and the industrial knowledge as well as the business knowledge they grew would grow, grow into a network of related businesses. The other thing is that they reinvested their new resources into, uh, into growth. They didn't just let it go out into the traditional economy. They captured that in their own bank and they developed that with mechanisms for growth. And last was that they had technical assistance and education for cooperatives. Um, you know, when I was getting going, you would try to talk to an attorney or an accountant about starting a cooperative. And the first thing they would try to do is talk you out of it. Um, so we needed to create our own staff that had our own attorneys and accountants on it that could say, oh yeah, that's actually really beneficial. And there's actually some things set up in the law that are really help for that. And this is how we go about it. So for want of uh, an existing bank uh, or entrepreneurial division, we just decided that the, those among us who had some uh, legal background and finance background and training background would form a group to start getting co-ops going. Um, but there really was a question whether there was anything at all, and this would be the next slide, um, that you could learn from cooperatives um, in, in the Basque region of Spain. A lot of people said, well, the, the U.S. just were too individualistic. There's nothing we can learn, learn from a much more democratic culture in the Basque region. We thought that was a little odd because, of course, um, the co-ops and now it's spread throughout Spain and just, you know, over a ways in Italy, they actually had more cooperatives and actually more rich networks. So we thought that was kind of an excuse to do nothing. Uh, we said, yes, it's true. You can't import something from another culture exactly as is, but there are aspects of uh, participatory democracy that we can draw on in our own culture. And we also thought it was true that you shouldn't try to import the exact economic model. What people had done when they studied Mondragon is they said, oh, well, they, they make uh, washing machines and refrigerators and things like that um, in big factories. That's what we'll do here. It didn't seem really the right model that you really have to look at what's working in the economy you're in and where you might have an advantage. And for us, we didn't think our advantage was going to be into uh, businesses that had a lot of um, equipment and capital. We thought our, we were really going to succeed where we had skilled labor um, and motivated labor because they were worker owners. It was also true, though, we said that you, you can't just uh, ignore the existing business environment. And we looked around and we said, well, what is it working from a point, from a point of view of business and uh, at this point? And, and what we found was the chains and, and uh, franchises were really growing. We happen to be the kind of people who don't like franchises and chains. 
Um, but we said, you know, what what is it we can learn from their business operations and leave behind some of the uh, more uh, difficult aspects? And really, we thought that uh, the major problem was that they were top down and they were drawing money from the local communities and that they were kind of imposing a particular business model on every place they went. And we thought it was it was possible to actually turn that around and actually have shared services without having shared control. Uh, having central services without having central control and that really we would put the cooperatives and the local communities in control and actually have them calling the shots in terms of what services to provide. So we went about trying to create a, um, a kind of a, an anti-franchise or an upside down franchise. So that will lead us to our next slide. So we looked around for a successful cooperative we could grow new businesses based on and there was one in the in Berkeley called the Cheese Board Collective and they um, had uh, about 60 workers at that point and $5 million in annual sales coming out of one fairly small store. So that definitely seemed like it had some some potential to it. Uh, so the next slide and kind of skipping ahead in our history, uh, we now have six cooperative uh, bakery, pizzeria, cafes in the Bay Area. Um, and as a side note, but we can pursue it if you're interested, the next slide, we, we also have an Arismendi pizza back in the the Basque region. So our story has kind of full, come full circle. Um, but focusing more on where we are in the U.S., uh, our more recent direction has been to create land development cooperatives. So we have a construction cooperative and we have a landscape build design cooperative. And uh, our vision from the beginning has been that the, hoping that the designers and the builders would collaborate in creating affordable housing um, in a project we call Roots and Returns Cooperative. Um, basically, you can't compete with people for land anymore in the Bay Area because it's become so expensive. Um, we're, so we're looking for areas that are underdeveloped to create new housing in, That's especially uh, what sometimes people refer to as in-law units or backyard cottages. Uh, so that's an exciting point because uh, next slide, you'll see that we are uh, about 90% of the way to completion on our first prototype here in Oakland, California. Um, and uh, we're hoping that that prototype then becomes the basis for an expanding network of affordable housing throughout the Bay Area and uh, then can become a model that's adopted in other parts of the country. So where we are now is we have nine cooperatives, um, uh, just focusing on the ones in the Bay Area. Um, and the ninth cooperative is what we call the development support cooperative, which is the one with the bookkeepers, the attorney and the trainers. Um, we all make up one large cooperative together called the Aris Media Association. And just like any cooperative, we have a board of directors, but we call them the policy council so that they don't get into their head that they're supposed to manage people. Their job is to set policy for the overall direction of the cooperatives. But the main policy directive they give is a plan to the development support cooperative saying this is the services we want you to provide and uh, to new cooperatives as well as existing ones. So that would be next slide. So I'm part of that cooperative. So they, you know, we come up with plans in terms of what not kind of cooperative we think we should develop next and where, but it's really the overall democratic uh, process of the organization that decides what we're going to do next. Uh, next slide. What what makes that work financially? We've actually never taken any grants or government um, money, um, and we've not taken any investment until we were looking at taking investment for this housing project that we're creating, the affordable housing project. Um, but up till now, all of our funds have been developed by the successful cooperatives we create. Uh, once they become profitable, they start to pay fees back into the association that develops, uh, pays for the support services, but also creates a kind of a, a war chest to, to create new cooperatives. The formula we use now primarily is called the solidary worker formula. So if you imagine 20 workers working at a bakery, um, there's a 21st worker that they're paying they pay the same wages and benefits and profit sharing to that person whose job really is to develop the benefits of cooperation for people who don't have those cooperative jobs yet. And why do we do that? Next slide. Um, 
These are some of the selections for our mission statement is to assure opportunities for workers control of their livelihood with fairness and equality for all. Um, but if you look at the last point, it's also to promote cooperative economic democracy as a sustainable and humane option uh, for our society. So um, we don't think of ourselves as um, as a standalone project. We think of ourselves more as a school for democracy and uh, a laboratory that we're hoping to develop networks of cooperative organizations throughout the world uh, links with. So very pleased to be with you uh, as for, as fellow members of the labor movement um, to figure out how we can collaborate more. Thank you so much, Tim. I That was so interesting and I have so many questions, but I'm gonna hold my questions. And for those other people that are brimming with ideas and questions, if you could write them write them down either in the chat or so forth um, or on your own paper so that uh, it'll be available to you after we hear from Joseph and myself. Joseph, your turn, you're on. But you are on mute. It looks like. OK, so let's see if we can make this happen. Uh, <laughs> hold on one second. And I also did email you the slides just right now <laughs> in case that I can't do it. Uh, all right, how about this? Let's show a window and show this. OK, can you see my screen here? All right, awesome. So um, I'm going to start. So yeah, my name is Joseph Curitan. Um, we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about Obron, but first I'll tell you a teeny tiny bit about myself. Um, I am not a uh, cooperative, uh, sort of like steeped in the cooperative tradition. I consider myself sort of like a recovering tech bro. And like I come to this movement really earnestly and sort of uh, without pretense, I, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So let's just start with that. Uh, and first, <laughs> and what I'm going to say might also be completely heretical. Sorry. Uh, also, so all of that sort of like, you know, uh, context aside, uh, Obron itself and sort of like what sort of our basis, our root, why we exist is really to put the engines of business to work for humanity, for people. So our goal is to be the world's largest worker conglomerate. Um, and what that means for us is it means building useful, uh, really first, profitable and impactful businesses for people, for our members, their communities, and the customers that they serve, right? And lastly, we think of Obron as sort of a, a vehicle for rad politics. We think about Obron a little bit just as a, a, a tool uh, to help folks embrace the struggle of building an enterprise that really helps to actually change structures of inequity, to actually change the, the places that they work and the communities that they're a part of. Um, so like Tim, you know, we're, we're sort of an experiment, a, a laboratory, a testing ground, and hopefully an educational sort of thing. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like brain damage, but, you know, there we go. Um, and most of all, really what we're trying to do is, again, be a platform for uh, what our values are and sort of like why we exist. So, you know, the problem that we're starting to address and why we came together in the first place um, is that small business is hard as hell. So I don't care if you are a baker or a construction worker or uh, a chief executive of a small business, uh, running a small business is just hard, right? Um, from startup costs and really like how you actually get started with the business to the market just trying to crush you. Um, it really doesn't matter what type of enterprise you are, it's all hard. Um, and so for us, we really saw that uh, problem, but specifically to small businesses, we also saw the problem uh, to cooperatives. Uh, and one of the big, you know, kind of corollaries are sort of in, in three different axes. One is access to capital. Um, so it kind of doesn't matter if you're a co-op or not, access to capital is hard. Um, but in a co-op, there's some specific problems with access to capital. One is the founder's dilemma. Right. So as a founder of a business, everybody's trying to shoot for that upside in the business. Right. So the risk return profile for a cooperative entrepreneur is a mismatch with what the market realities of entrepreneurship are. And, you know, our, our cooperative came out of three guys in Baltimore coming out of prison and jail trying to get a job. Like collateral is not a thing that, that, that they have. Um, so that access and lack of collateral is really real. Uh, the second is, is growth mindset. 
And while Tim and Erismendi are, are, are sort of an outlier in the space, scale and the actual vision for scale mode appetite for risk is not something that is like part and parcel of, of being a co-op, right? Um, in fact, most cooperatives are fairly risk averse because their whole purpose is to preserve whatever the use is for their membership. And the last for us is really management expertise. So, you know, I think about management, like I think about a person swinging a hammer, building a house. It's a, it's a skill, right? Um, and just because it's a skill that is kind of sequestered in ivory towers and meant for specific people, um, it doesn't negate the fact that it's a, a skill and it's a tool and that those professional networks and the capital to actually attract that talent are needed to grow. Um, and so for us, these problems sort of uh, came in multiple forms and fashions, but really it, it sort of begged one central question is, why not conglomerate? Why not use the tools of corporate America, the things that make the sort of terrible metastasization of capitalism uh, work for our advantage? Why not try and apply some of the principles of judo to business? So for us, what we really want to do is think about acquiring and holding profitable small businesses, but not just to hold and acquire, but for, you know, to transition and to trans, uh, uh, sort of like translate the value to our member of. And lastly is the, the back office, the strategic sort of management that those large conglomerates come together and, and deploy, we saw as beneficial. So in, instead of having everything pushed down to its most local extreme, we really wanted central, you know, uh, centralization of that management and centralization of um, strategic vision plan. And the last piece is we felt like that also brought solidarity to, to bear in the beginning. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, our workers, our, our, our members are, our, are our, our owners, right? And more so than that, they are the, the board. <laughs> and more so than that, they do set the tone and strategic decision making across the organization. So our, our solution really looks at both participation when it comes to economic upside, but it also looks at engagement, right? So how do you actually show up to work in solidarity with everyone? And if I'm a, again, construction worker in one business that we acquire, and a healthcare worker in another business that we acquire, those two uh, markets, those two factors could be at odds in some years or could really be in confluence in some years. But the solidarity is actually seeing that every person, regardless of compensation, regardless of wage, regardless of position within the enterprise, actually does own the enterprise collectively together and benefits both use value, financial value, and experience of power um, from membership. We are structured as a for-profit. We do have a fiscally sponsored nonprofit project. Um, Tim you know, had mentioned that Erismendi has never accepted grants or outside investment. We see capital as a, as a hammer that we wanna wield and that we will accept from anybody <laughs> uh, on our terms and the way that we want. Um, but that being said, you know, we do structure things in a way that positions those uh, control fa you know, the, the factors of control in a way that always has the workers uh, sort of uh, supremacy sort of in, in, its, in its rightful position. Um, and so lastly for us, sort of what it means to be a member, there is a financial commitment. So every member, regardless of where you are coming in from, whatever workplace you're a part of, you have to pay $250 to be a member. It's an investment. It is something that is held in the cooperative until you leave. The last part is you do have to tithe or you have to give 1% of what you would have taken home in pay to the core, to the central cooperative. There's only one co-op in our ecosystem and that's over. And every worker, regardless of what you make, pays that 1%. The last piece is at the end of the day, when you leave the cooperative, you take that with you. Um, you can either transition it to an investor membership or you can cash out. But regardless is that is an expression of solidarity across every worker. The second part is every business, regardless of what business it is, is owned by Obra. So all the cap table, you know, 100% of the cap table is owned by Obra. So all profits flow up and then are distributed to workers based on time worked. So again, solidarity in action for us looks like equal participation in voting, but also equal participation in the upside, in the actual profits of the business. And for us, we kind of think about profits as like, as a little bit like farts, right? Exact exhaust. Like if you're focusing too much on profits, you're looking at the wrong side of the end, right? Um, but moving forward, so we are not a federalist cooperative. So like Erismindi or like Mondragon, 
our businesses are not our members. Our members are our people, our, our individuals. So we're much more akin to a credit union than we are to a uh, federation, right? Even though we have multiple entities, those entities sort of are just pieces of paper. Think about them as almost like business lines or, or you know, storefronts. Um, and you know, for us, we are not a corporate entity. We don't have a floating price maturation rights on on shares. We don't, you know, those those are non-transferable sort of shares. It's a it's a co-op, and it's through and through, right? Obron's shares are fixed in value. Each of them has, you know, one member, one vote, and are restricted, so they're non-transferable. Um, you know, there is no secondary market for our uh, cooperative shares at all, and we like it that way. Um, we actually have sort of a poison pill in the business that will never sell. So, you know, for us, the point is that we're here to stay. Um, you know, for us, the other side of it is we're not an ESA, right? So a lot of folks are like, oh, you're like an ESA. It's like, well, no. I mean, ultimately, we're a co-op <laughs> that just happens to buy businesses. Um, ESOPs, again, floating point equity. There is a trust that owns the business, not you. Um, and the last piece about the, it's, you know, like the difference here is, you know, we don't look at solely market factors, but we do utilize some of the market factors when we're doing valuations for underlying businesses. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. But lastly, and sort of like really most importantly, why we exist is this membership, you know, for our members is this membership model. So we look at just traditional employer sell benefits. We do want to target great wages, right? Workers are workers and they deserve a wage. But we also want to layer in the things like democratic management and the member benefits that come with worker ownership, not just being a worker, right? So for us, that looks like, of course, uh, the ability to actually have um, engagement, empowerment, and self-direction when it comes to managing your own enterprise, your own business. When you look at one business in Oberon, its management team and capacity and staff looks like one business in Oberon. Um, the second piece is we do really want to have member benefits that are tied both financially, right? So think about things like a profit sharing wage or, you know, things like that. But also we want useful benefits like tailored affordable housing programs. We own six pieces of residential property in Baltimore City that houses some of our members in one of our businesses, right? And we're growing past that. So like the use value is also really important to us as well. You know, our solution sort of really is repeatable as well. So think about it sort of like, you know, our unit is a business and, you know, the factory floor is our deal room. And so what we really want to do is bring new businesses in, convert them, and bring them into ownership under the worker control of, of the membership. Um, you know, we do have a independent finance vehicle that's actually a $30 million debt fund that we use in order to acquire the uh, underlying businesses as, you know, that's our equity position in those underlying businesses. Um, at the end of the day, the cap table of the enterprise, once all debt services is, is rendered, is inured to Obron membership, right? So you know, ultimately we, we own the thing. Um, the last thing is the way that we actually go out and find these businesses. Uh, we do believe in entrepreneurship. We think that entrepreneurs actually are important sort of uh, ingredients into this mix of, of cooperative reality. And so we find and help entrepreneurs um, develop a thesis, develop a, a thought of, you know, a strategy to go out and address the market. And then we look at the customers, the communities that they're wanting to serve. And we say, is that something we want to be a part of? Is that a place where we want to play? Um, we then finance those transactions that they bring to us. And those workers, the uh, uh, entrepreneurs, end up running those businesses for a time um, and then transition out. So we're not a collective. We do believe in hierarchical management in a lot of ways. Um, and in some ways, uh, we vary differently depending on industry and depending on what the type of business is. Uh, so lastly, sort of like how our management works. Uh, so the cooperative installs management into our subsidiaries. Those subsidiaries run and operate like a business. Those employees are eligible for membership at the co-op and are also eligible to, for, uh, to elect a board of directors at their underlying subsidiary. So out of a sort of, think about it kind of like a two-tier system, right? So the thing that's closest to the customer and the thing that's closest to the member, right? And at each of those extremes, workers have supremacy or sort of workers have the, uh, the, the last rep, right? Um, and so for us, that really sort of manifests in, uh, you know, an election process. Um, we're about to go into our third election process this year. Um, and yeah, I mean, we've had contested elections every year. It's been great, right? Uh, you know, 
what locality could really even say that? So, you know, ultimately uh, that is sort of like what control looks like, but the solution sort of a unifying back office services are things like simple things, right? So like HR and legal, um, you know, we've got one sort of general counsel that does all of our legal, which is, which is great, shares, shares some costs. Um, and then growth things like business development, right? So a centralized call operation that helps to drum up new business um, or leadership development that actually helps to, you know, share out how what weekly business reviews, monthly business reviews, and quarterly business reviews look like in each of our units. Um, or credit services, financing to acquire or financing to grow. Um, and then member services, education, right? So the underlying worker needs to understand what it means to be a new member owner in Obron. And, it, and it's different, and it just is. Um, so I'm going to sort of like speed through the rest of it because I think I'm low on time. So, you know, ultimately, we're part of a growing movement. We're not the only folks out there doing this. However, I think that we might be one of the first to do the conglomerate thing. But I hope everybody on this call will then go out and, you know, talk to your local worker co-op and say, you should go and acquire your competitors because then you'll be another worker co-op co uh, uh, conglomerate, which there should be more. Of, uh, and uh, sort of our, you know, our current constellation of businesses, we operate across basically four, and then we have a real estate uh, division, uh, operating company uh, verticals, uh, core staffing, and our, our project with Humanum are all employment services, so staffing operations, um, construction operations, look at uh, renovations and remodeling of homes. Um, technology operations are things like uh, break rooms, which is a pandemic sort of startup uh, project, really fun, basically asynchronous um, communications with teams, um, and then real estate, right? So we really do want to have that use value of real estate for every worker in our in our in our enterprise. Um, and then lastly, of course, is capital, right? So uh, funding to actually um, move forward with it. Our, our last vertical and the thing that we're really excited about is health. We're actually under uh, contract right now to acquire our first business in that vertical um, in the Pacific Northwest. So fingers crossed, it'll be really good before the close of the year. Um, and yeah, I mean, ultimately, each of these strategies, each of these verticals are run by an entrepreneur that actually goes out to market, finds and acquires a, a, a company, and then grows it, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, at the end of the day. Um, can walk through a bunch of these, um, but I actually want to preserve time for uh, Q&A. So I'll just stop right there. This is awesome. I'm super inspired. And both thinking about what's so fun about hearing about both of yours is Ares Mendy. I mean, so you've even gone to San Sebastian, but, but you want to see this happening all over. Joseph is encouraging all of us to become conglomerates. Like, I mean, it's like the point is we want to see these things happen all over and these experiments are really cool. So I just also want to let you know there are two lawyers that are interested. They that are interested in some questions. I can see both Eric Britton and Matt Curry have some thoughts. And after I speak, um, uh, boy, and I have so many questions for you all too, but I will not dominate, uh, hopefully. Um, and, uh, but I'll, I'll let them up. And so we can hear from those two lawyers who will have an interesting perspective. Um, so Co-op Cincy. Co-op Cincy is quite distinct from the models that we've currently heard about. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here, window, let's find, there it is. All right, let me go to that window and put it in present mode. All right, so Co-op Cincy is a nonprofit that accepts a lot of grant money. That is where we principally get things from. But I love, love, our goal is to become um, fully self-sufficient from our co-ops. But we have started with a lot of different startup co-ops. Um, and so to Joseph's point about how hard that is, how long to get to us, um, profitability, et cetera. Um, anyway, we, we couldn't agree more. This is actually an older picture of our network. There's currently 14 co-ops that are a part of it. And Apple Street, sadly, is no more. So this is an older one. But it does highlight, um, so we're, we're a nonprofit that supports these co-ops in various ways. I'll explain that in a moment. We have basically four main programs, which you can kind of see here, but there's a, probably a clearer slide, so let me move there. This is what we want. It's what all of us want, an economy that works for all. And the strategies we do to get there um, is support the launch of new co-op businesses. The way we do that is through a program we have called Co-op U. Um, I'll have a slide on that a little bit more, but it's a 
it's an intensive 14 week process um, where we use some of what we've learned from Mondragon's incubator, Sayalan, and what we've learned from Lean Startup and things like that. And it's really iterative group supply and we support them through that 14 week process to really kind of de-risk their businesses as much as possible. Um, once they've been through that, uh, they have the ability opportunity to receive a loan because we're part of the Seed Commons Financial Cooperative. Um, assist, we assist, like Joseph was talking about, we have also a program to assist existing businesses to transition to worker ownership. So uh, we do that through the Business Legacy Fund transition program, as well as our acquisition cooperative search fund cohort. So the way those differ is that through the Business Legacy Fund transition program, Businesses apply to us for support in transitioning. So they kind of self-identify and we work with them. So we started this program a year or so ago and initially 12 businesses applied. We selected six that had strong enough financials and were good candidates, worked with them last year. Um, this right now, um, Shine, which is exciting, which is um, a child care center, is um, is transitioning to worker ownership, which is cool. But the other ones had lost value because of COVID. There were two manufacturers, a dry cleaner, a coffee roastery, and a music distributor. And they uh, have wanted to wait until they can bring their value up uh, before they sell to their employees. So then we started this past summer, something that's similar to what Joseph is talking about, where we brought in um, like this awesome cohort. We have five wonderful um, professional managers who we're working with to identify businesses that we proactively acquire and support them in helping to, we're working directly with those professional managers to transition them into worker ownership. So hopefully we too will have one, I hope by the end of the year. Um, it's related to a foundry and an aluminum foundry, um, but it may not be there. It may be, you know, early next year, hopefully. I mean, there's so many things that can go sideways, but um, it's a very, it is exciting that that group right now, uh, we're going through a 12 week process, a cooperative management certificate that they will receive from Xavier University's um, Center for Leadership. Then we also provide ongoing support to our existing network of co-ops. So that group of 14 that I mentioned, we support them in all kinds of ways um, through team meetings. We, our goal is to create an economy that works for all, especially those who have been historically excluded. So uh, trying to demystify um, finances, play the great game of business, support people with developing greater communication skills and so forth, uh, to tap into the collective wisdom and so forth. We work with them each week, um, support the management teams, also provide access to capital through the Seed Commons. Um, and then we do a lot with strengthening our statewide and national co-op networks, as well as participate in co-op policy efforts. So I, these are just like, that's one co-op you. We have a variety of those. This is, I'm just, that's how we support our co-ops. It would have probably been more interesting if I would have showed you these slides. Sorry about that. Um, and some of the pictures of our co-ops, I would say. And also housing, just like you were talking about. We also um, have a focus. We have, this is Renting Partnerships, which is a land trust that's a part of our network. And I'm going to stop now to talk about, but, but they have a really neat way of doing housing called dividends. It's interesting. It's come up in each of our, each of our um, presentations so far, but they have a thing called dividend housing. And the way this works is uh, renters actually build financial equity in the process of renting affordable housing. And they do so by, through this really cool process in which they, um, they, every week, they, the residents do a weekly work assignment. Every month, they participate in a resident meeting. That's where they set the rules and determine what they need to do. And then they pay their, they agree to pay their rent on time. Every time they do that every month, they get financial credits. After five years, um, they have 
they are eligible to receive $4,038. And that also doesn't come from grant money. That's the money in the pro forma set aside. Normally, um, people in affordable housing are moving every one and a half to two years. And so to release that unit, it takes quite a bit of money to get that back out there, the management to find the people, all of that kind of stuff. And because this is just a way of like putting a value on that incredible social capital that they are doing so that they can participate in that. And after 10 years, they'll have 10,000 if they haven't taken it out, et cetera. It's very cool. Um, at this moment, I'm going to come back and just talk about how I want to stop sharing, but it doesn't want me to stop sharing. Oh, I see. Yes, I can do that. Okay. So, um, so what I would say is, so so here's where we are right now. Um, and we are in process and we're a massive experiment. And I'm hoping what we learned today will help us get structured more in a more sophisticated way. At the moment, um, each of our co-ops has the ability to be part of our co-op of co-op networks on the board, like it's a subcommittee of the co-op Cincy board. So the, what we have is similar to one part of Mondragon, which is inside that that ten percent of their profits come to the to the larger whole, and that those co-op members that are part of our co-op, like again, right now it's just a part of the co-op Cincy board, like the nonprofits board, a subcommittee. Um, decides where that 10% goes. So does that go towards new co-op development? Does it go to our loan fund? Does it go to supporting their co-ops in particular ways? It's not a lot of money right now. Um, and there's it's also divided up by now, or at least the draft policy is that there are provisional members, those that agree to the Mondragon. So we, we follow um, that Mondragon union co-op template. So everyone agrees, has to agree to the Mondragon co-op principles. You agree to union neutrality. You're part of the network that allows you to gain access to the loans. You get the coaching. All these sorts of things happen. But you have to, um, in order to be a full member, you have to have, or at least this is where we're currently thinking, um, that you have to have at least two full-time worker owners um, that you need to be, uh, sorry, we have some excitement in this realm, um, that we, uh, let's see, two full-time worker owners, that you have to have been a member for at least six months, that you need to be participating in. We have, we have a few different characteristics of how you're participating in all of the coaching and all the events and all these sorts of things. But what we're wanting to do is move that into a, we're wanting to like let this grow a little bit, but we want to move it into an actual co-op either, uh, like a co-op of co-ops um, that is its own entity. So um, with that, I'm going to stop at this moment and let both Eric Britton and Matt Curry onto the scene. These are both attorneys in Ohio. Um, I'm so curious. I hope to, I only see Eric Britton. But, Oops, you see me. I don't see my own picture yet. Well, I actually, I don't physically see you, but I see your name. And okay. Matt Curry disappeared entirely. So I'm not sure where he is. But Eric Britton, would you want to um, ask some questions? First of all, I want to ask questions, which is, can I join both of these organizations? I am inspired by what I've heard from both Joseph and Tim. It's great. Um, they're a little further along maybe than we are, but they have got some definite ideas that are worth stealing. couple questions. I've worked a lot with agricultural co-ops in the Midwest. That's, in fact, where I got my grounding in co-ops before I started working on worker co-ops. And there is a relatively large financial institution, Co-op Bank, that is primarily driven to financing agricultural co-op development isn't controlled by any particular co-op, wondered if we could get enough strength there in numbers to convince CoBank to really be interested in worker co-ops or alternatively create a parallel institution that's a financing source that each of the co-op and co-op development organizations that need financing to would help develop. Second thing that jumps out at me is one of the huge problems I struggle with or that my clients ask me about and I don't have good answers to 
is a lot of the worker co-ops, there are community members that aren't actually workers or customers who would love to help the co-op develop, would like to provide some financing, maybe even invest in the co-op. And I always struggle for community members who won't be accredited investors, how we take their money if there are more than a few of them. I liked what I heard uh, about, the Ober about the Oberon model for allowing investment in the debt uh, in your debt financing fund. But that's a real issue I think works where you have lots of community members who are interested in making small investments. How do you take advantage of that to leverage the development of worker co-ops? I'll let it go there. I'm sure Kristen has questions and Matt will when they come in, but those are two big ones for me. How do we get a bank and how do we take community, uh, community support and money under state securities rules? It also, Tim, it look, were you about to answer that? It looks like Joseph's excited, but it seemed like you went off mute. So do you want to go ahead and start? I'm happy to go after Joseph. <laughs> Guys, just go ahead. All right, fine. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, so uh, what is the role of traditional co-op financial institutions within financing worker cooperative sector? And how can you accept small dollar uh, contributions or capital allocations from local people? from individuals. Uh, first thing, uh, actually, unfortunately, before uh, Chuck Snyder passed away very recently, NCB president uh, gathered together a round table of folks in the co-op community and asked this very question. And really the, you know, the, everybody from nationwide to NCB to CoBank to, you know, uh, Capital Impact Partners and some of the, you know, intermediaries and had started some momentum and some movement around that very around that very question. I think some of the things that came out of that were um, a syndicated loan pool, right? So think one percent of agricultural or uh, purchasing cooperatives allocating off their balance sheet, either participating out debt, you know, a, a debt structure for to then to go to the public markets or then go to like you know other high net worth individuals to um, uh, to, to to lean against or just a, a dedicated pool to syndicate out loans, right? Um, and, you know, like, what is the administrative body of that? That Like, all of those design questions sort of are coming. Um, but there's there's will, actually, now. Uh, and I think, like, the, you know, for those larger financial institutions like credit unions that are maybe not part of inclusive, but are that are part of, you know, the national, you know, uh, NCUA, like, you know, ultimately, uh, those institutions see it as an opportunity to sort of like look at talent pipelines, right? Uh, look at innovative business models to stay relevant. Um, so I, I think Eric, you're on to something and you're timely. Um, I think getting more folks together more often is always the issue. Um, and it's starting to happen. So that's good. Uh, then the second piece is, I mean, um, talk to your uh, senators about how like patriarchal and terrible and sort of like paternalistic the Securities and Exchange Act of 1933 and onward is. Um, you know, we're not plebs anymore. Uh, you know, so, I mean, there's always self-directed IRAs through, you know, uh, things like, well, there's always self-directed IRAs that you could go and allocate towards, but I mean, that's securities law, right? I mean, even yeah. if you're a co-op, you're still going to have to do the same securities law sort of requirements as any other traditional business. So, you know, we're raising primarily, we're only raising for accredited investors in our, in our, you know, debt fund because of that issue, right? I'd love to have folks in our community give us money to do and then give them back with a little surplus, but not really, not really a thing that's scalable. Not at the really moment. a thing. I've got a client um, that I think, Kristen knows that some of them may even be on the call listening if, but haven't commented yet, where we've talked to the Ohio Securities Division about trying to find a way to sell. This is somewhere of a cross between co-op membership stock and investment in a nonprofit, just trying to find the weasel saying, these people are not angel investors looking for a strong financial return. They've got a nonprofit purpose. We haven't made headway even, yet. I might even play with the use, right? So like, what if you have patronage? What if you're a financial cooperative and then your patronage yeah. allocation is just based on the net profitability of all the debt notes that the fund, yeah. you know, that the, that the institute, the nonprofit allocates? You know, there's nothing, nothing stopping that. The, 
you know. I'm going to bring Tim in now. Sorry. Um, yeah. To answer. No, you guys are great. There's a lot of energy here. Go ahead, Tim. And there's another question in the chat for you, which is what kind of wages and benefits do workers at the Arizmendi Enterprises earn? Sure. I'll uh, start off with Eric's and then I'll address that. Um, so thank you, Eric, for your, your uh, enthusiasm and your ideas. And um, I definitely am thinking along the same way long lines um, about how we gather smaller investments into a cooperative enterprise. Um, California law, believe it or not, despite our other reputations, not very progressive when it came to cooperatives. It didn't actually have a worker cooperative statute. So we had to build a bunch of worker co-ops before we had a statute to actually recognize them and then had to go to the state legislature and say, hey, can you, can you build these new provisions in for us? Um, which they did a few years back. And one of the things that we got through and we kind of snuck through, and I would say steal this if you can, is that we're able to take $1,000 uh, investments from people who are um, community investors, we call them, um, without any other securities regulations. So if you're within California, you can put in $1,000 um, to our co-op. Now we could have actually done that before because the statute for co-op said that there was a, um, exemption for um, for a membership share up to $600. We, we, we actually lobbied to get it up to a thousand. So we could have just said they were members um, and then kind of uh, tinkered with our, stat our our bylaws so that we, we didn't actually have them voting on an equal basis with the workers. But what we did is we were able to create a, a class of uh, members who, who do have an exemption up to a thousand dollars without having voting rights in the co-ops management, they have voting rights over anything that has to do with their property rights. So th that is actually what we're hoping to do along the lines of what it sounds like uh, Cincy is doing with um, in terms of creating a real estate investment cooperative. So our developments um, for developing accessory dwelling units as affordable housing, our hope is that there's a lot of people who are sick, sick to death of what gentrification is doing um, that they would want to put their money into a vehicle that was doing something different. So it's like, great, you can all put in $1,000 each, accredited investors, you can put in more, and we're gonna go build this housing and we're gonna pay you a rate of interest. It's not gonna be based on profitability because that's not what we're aiming for. We're aiming for expansion of, to more people, um, but to build that option in is, is what we're looking at. So Tim, also, that that's very interesting and I don't, I think you had a chance yet to answer that one question in the uh, chat. Sorry. Okay. So uh, to give some some uh, baseline, most people in California who are starting out as bakers are getting paid somewhere between ten dollars and eleven dollars an hour, and they have no benefits at all. We always make sure to start our cooperatives with uh, what we consider to be a living wage, as well as health insurance, which again most bakers don't have. So if you're looking at that. Uh, by MIT's definition of a living wage, that would be about 1776 right now in the Bay Area. Still not enough to secure you affordable, ha uh, secure housing, but um, better than we're paying, uh, uh, bakers typically paid. Then when the cooperative starts to do better, they're able to share out profits among themselves, technically patronage. Um, and our most mature cooperatives are paying about $40 an hour. So they might be paying something like $26 an hour in wages, but they're also paying full health insurance for themselves as well as dependents, um, retirement benefits, and profit sharing, which would raise it to over $40 an hour, which is quite good for a baker. Um, still difficult to, to get along in the Bay Area, but we're, we're doing better. Nice. So, okay, so here's our situation. We only have four more minutes, and I just was reminded to look at the question and answer in addition to the chat. Um, so between those two, I'm going to just throw out three questions. And here's my request. Tim and Joseph, would you be willing to answer some questions maybe via email that I could send out to interested people? Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So, so here we go. Um, is Joseph, is your economic model similar to a corporate structure in part because U.S. business law favors that model of use pooling of capital? That is one question. Tim, um, are each of the Eras Mendy, all of the groups, are they individual entities and part of the larger whole, or are they all part of the larger whole? Um, here is another one. 
Um, can anyone speak to using WeFunder as a tool for crowdfunding more medium scale co-ops? That might also be a good question and a financial one that's in the next one. Um, how can, Joseph, how can unions and labor be a part of your model? Um, and Joseph, can you share anything more about the new Pacific Northwest Health Company acquisition? And what's the difference between collecting capital for funding co-ops and a credit union using their pool of capital to do the same thing? Don't banks basically do this with a portion of their capital from customers' deposits? That was a lot. So do what we can in two minutes. Okay. Uh, I can go really, <laughs> I, I can speak pretty fast. So I'll just answer okay. mine rapid fire. Uh, so put in the chat a little bit of how unions might be able to help with Obron. We are partnered with SEIU, Florida Public Services Union, in a project in Florida specifically targeting municipal contractors. So if there's other unions that have like tight knit relationships with industry like that, that's awesome. We love that. And then the outcome is an organized shop, right? So at the end of the day, each of those uh, independent workplaces have the option, if they so choose, uh, to organize under SEIU, which we're all in favor of. We like that. Um, Second piece is uh, floor, or sorry, the Pacific Northwest deal. I can give broad strokes. The ink hasn't really been inked, you know, so uh, bear with me. Um, but uh, around 580, uh, sorry, sorry, 520 uh, incoming new workers um, into Obron, uh, roughly 15, or sorry, 16 million in revenue, roughly 2 million in profit, 30-year-old um, business in. Uh, you know, home care sector in Pacific Northwest. Um, and the last thing for me was, sorry. Oh. Uh, that was pretty good, yeah. unless you have All an right. experience with WeFunder. I think you racked it. Okay, great. There we go. I'll stop. All right. Tim? So, uh, quick answer is, uh, yes, each of our cooperatives is separately incorporated as a cooperative corporation. And then uh, the one exception is the staff collective. We decide not to separately incorporate it because we want it to be accountable to the work to the to members directly. So we are an, uh, employees of the collective that is owned by each of the work, worker based co-ops. Got it. OK, very helpful. Any experience with WeFunder? Uh, no, except uh, one of our colleagues is now trying to develop a platform that would be specifically to exploit this statute in the California law that would have been the $1, allowed that. Nice. So if you're interested in building those kind of things, we have some people for you to talk to. Okay, the one, one of the other... things that would be awesome on that would be if we could get a co-op of accountants that was accountable to a network of co-ops that would help put together the financial information you'd need to do a good job on the crowdfunding. We definitely have some successful bookkeeping cooperatives, but one that would actually include CPAs is something we're still chasing. Yeah. The, the very last question, um, I think this one didn't yet get answered, is what is the difference between collecting capital for funding co-ops that through the mechanisms you're talking about versus a credit union using their pool of capital, capital to do the same thing? Got it. So a credit union is a worker or is a co-op. It's not a worker co-op. It is a co-op of members. So it's little to nothing. The only difference is that it's a regulated institution and a worker cooperative is not a regulated institution. Uh, that's one one piece. And I didn't see the like structure thing, but Tim, if there's anything other, if your thoughts, yeah. Yeah, real quick. Um... The, the, diffi uh, the difficulty with credit unions is the regulators try to regulate them away from doing business loans. Um, I was on the board of my, my credit union, which was literally called the Cooperative Center of Federal Credit Union <laughs> because it was started by co-ops and had a cooperative mission and they still didn't want us to lend to, to businesses. They basically just wanted you to lend for buying cars and buying houses. So actually increasing debt for your individual members. We have made some strides in that regard but the sad thing is, unless we can change the regulations for credit unions, what we really need to do is create a bank or loan, revolving loan funds, because yeah. that will allow us to be more entrepreneurial. Thank you all very much. On that note, we're going to leave, but there's some more interesting. There's a financial one in the next session that you might find interesting as well. That looks at some of those cool new possibilities emerging. So, and plus other cool sessions. So I wanna say thank you, Tim. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all the people in the chat. We are very appreciative and I hope you have an awesome rest of your day.
Bye-bye. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, all.